Welcome back to Hot Flashes and Cool Topics. Today is an absolute privilege for Bridget and I to introduce you to Dr. Gladys McGarry, who has written The Well-Lived Life, a 102-year-old doctor's six secrets to health and happiness at any age. Welcome to the show, Dr. McGarry. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, it's, it truly is a privilege. You have been called the mother of holistic medicine and your story of, of what you have achieved in your lifetime is so amazing. And you talk about six secrets to health and happiness. How did you choose those six secrets? Oh, you know, you just choose something. You've got to choose something. There are lots of secrets, but the ones that just kept popping up were these that are so important. Others trip off for those, but the, but the essence of the secret has to has to uh, manifest and 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 be aware. People, we need to become aware of them, and then you can do something about it. Yes, absolutely. And you know, I was just going down the list in the in reading your book, and the number one is you are here for a reason. Can you share with us why you chose that one? And it, it's just so uplifting too for every person. Talk about the juice, person. your life Yeah, energy. the juice. Yeah, the juice. I love it. Well, it, I think we all have that. I was just fortunate enough to have parents who had uh, the same, you know, had that kind of juice themselves. And and it, like in all things in life, it moves on and on and on and on. So their kind of dedication to health and healing and getting loved into the center of the whole healing process, into the work that they were doing, just it permeated what I did. And so I knew when I was two years old that I was a doctor. I mean, I just let them know that. And they accepted it. And I have a granddaughter who is, uh, well, I have three little granddaughters who are seven and eight, and they're all three doctors. <laughs> <laughs> One is even offering an internship to her grandmother. <laughs> oh, how sweet. <laughs> yeah. And in your book, you have the story of how you helped your mother and carrying the um the water was it? Well, it was the mixture. You mixed up the, um, the whole mixture of of potassium yeah. Yes, yes, and you did that. And a lot of people, there's times that they don't feel their juice, or maybe they weren't raised with the love that you were raised. Right. And I loved in there how you talked about movement, um, just to get your juice flowing. Can you share a little bit about movement? Well, you know. If you watch a plant, like say for, for a rose bush or a, a rose climbing up a trellis, they have to keep moving. If it gets stuck any place, they die. Life and love are integral parts of each other. In order to keep alive, to keep moving, love has to be the essence of why what you're doing, and as it, as you understand that, and as you love what's going on, the juice in you is looking for it. And, and it's looking for the light. And it's saying, well, where do I want to go? Do I want to go into darkness? Uh, well, I can check it out. But it's, ah, it, oh, that's not interesting. Look what's here. And you see something that gets your attention. And you move towards it. And that doesn't change from the time you're little on up until you're 102. It's something that is so integral part to our true human, human nature that if we're really wanting to be like E2, ET, you know, go back home, it's that reaching for the true aspect of our inner selves, which we all have. You talk about a higher sense of purpose and decreased mortality. Did you see in your patients over the years that once they kind of found that energy, it would heal any certain ailments that they had, as well as just giving them an overall sense of purpose? I have so many uh, 
friends and patients who I call uh, uh, persons who have lived with living medicine enough that their very essence depended on living with living with this concept that the life and love and movement towards the light was was essential. I had a friend that just died last month. Her service was just yesterday. Um, she was 76 years old, but she had lived since she was 18 months old with one quarter of one kidney. Now that wow. doesn't happen. And none of us in the field of medicine could ever understand how she was able to do that. And she wasn't really able to explain it to us, except that she, she said, well, I do what my body tells me I should do. And from that inner knowing from within herself, she was able to uh, say yes or no, or maybe to some of the medications or the therapies that were offered to her. And she chose, constantly chose what it was that she in her as the physician within her understood what was going on, was able to accept. I know that um, you have, I was reading in your book about what you feel in your body and making those choices. And you've had to go through those choices yourself. You've had two times you've had cancer in your life and how you combine what, I guess, Western medical practices with holistic practices. Can you talk a little bit about how those can combine and how you can make your personal choice about what you want to do? Well, let me tell you a story. <laughs> My oldest son is a retired orthopedic surgeon. And he came through Phoenix when he'd finished all of his training on his way to Del Rio, where he was going to start his practice of orthopedic surgery. And he said to me, Mom, you know, I'm I'm real scared. I'm going into the world and I'm going to have people's lives in my hands. I don't know if I can handle that. And I said, well, Carl, if you think you're the one that does the healing, you have a right to be scared. But it's your job to do the work that you've been trained to do, which are, is awesome. I mean, orthopedic surgery is really awesome work and it takes a lot of good understanding and and work with all sorts of things you use your training to do that and then support the patient as they do their healing and you support the patient with love and it's that kind of a of integrating each act that you do with understanding that you know you have a right to choose one way or another you talk about in the book um, self-healing and that we are capable of doing a lot of the work internally. Can you discuss the role of imagery in healing? It's vital. Uh, Dr. Elmer and Elise Green started the work with biofeedback way back in the 60s. <clears throat> and, you know, they were really good friends of ours and part of the holistic movement when we began that. But they understood that as a person visualized something, the body understood it and the body could then work with it. So, you know, it's like if, if something is not working right in your life, I mean, you're stuck someplace and, and it's sort of like having a bad uh, scrap, a cut on your arm you can keep picking at that scab and picking at that scab and feeling the pain and feeling bad about it and it won't heal. But if you can look at the, scab, the cut or whatever it is and acknowledge it for what it is and what it's trying to tell you and then you visualize it, visualize it healing it process you don't, you don't have to do anything fancy. You just let that part of your body know that, okay, I got it. Now let's go and do this thing. 
and leave the scab alone. Don't keep picking at that old scab. And it can happen, whether it's emotional, whether it's, it's a spiritual thing or a physical thing or anything. When we're stuck someplace that, that's really hard and bad and all, it feels so bad. And we can continue to feel bad because that feels like we should be feeling bad because, well, you know, whatever it is that we're putting on. And when we once get to the idea that we've had enough of that and we can move on to something that makes us feel good, we stop picking the scab. I was going to say, um, you know, Colleen mentioned earlier, too, about love. And I feel like you really brought out the love in your patience and the, shor- the stories that you share in your book. You can just, when you talk to your patients, you're bringing out the love in the moments when they are stuck. And you use so many wonderful examples um, and examples where they will feel a pain in their body. Like you're saying where they are stuck and they yeah. can't figure out. Um, there was a woman, I can't remember what her name was in the book, uh, for example, where she was feeling this pain and all the other tests showed that she really wasn't having, there wasn't anything really showing up. But how you talk with people, can you can you talk about how you would talk with people to figure out where they were blocked or where they were stuck? The first thing is I listen to them. I think it's you know, what What good is my just deciding, okay, well, you need this. Uh, I may be completely wackadoodle on that. I mean, it's just something that, that came into my head and I said it. Or I can spend time listening to what the patient is saying and deriving from that the questions that I can ask which help her to look at what it is that she's saying. Because as we tell our story and we listen to it, we begin to understand things too. And then the questions can come up and we can work together on it. So it's not something that that I'm telling the patient that she needs to do. It's the, the reality is I'm listening to what her inner physician is saying to her and that physician within her is saying well look at this I mean what how how about this idea and it may just be something flicked through or it may be something that just hits you woof yes I get it secret five you talk about is everything is your teacher And a lot of people will say, I don't necessarily want to learn the lessons that the universe is trying to teach me. How do you work with your patients to accept that everything is a lesson in life, that even suffering, and you're very honest about your own journey in life, but that even suffering is a, there's something, a lesson that can be learned. Well, because people really know that in their hearts, you know? In if but it's never been pointed out to them. Uh, if if suffering is suffering and you're supposed to suffer and and that's what a good person does, who is be, trying to be a good person, is they're suffering with the suffering. You just hang on to the suffering, or you say, "Well, you know, I've done that long enough, and I understand that suffering is there and and." Yeah, it hurts and and it has its reason and it was and it well it sucks. It's just not good, you know. So but I don't I don't need to so, sort of suck on a lemon all the time, you know. I can I can get myself an orange <laughs> and it's or whatever. It's it's a matter of, of choice. And choosing what it is that we, in our innermost being, is trying to ask and trying to bring to the consciousness of the my whole body, mind, and spirit combination. Because all parts of myself has to understand it. Um, another thing you talk about is just is just 
that you're just spending your energy wildly. I love that concept. Um, can you talk about how it's like either it's created or destroyed and how, how can we, I don't know, your advice for people, what that would mean to spend your energy wildly? Well, you know, it's like I had a patient that uh, said absolute, she was so tired, she just couldn't move. And uh, the doctor that she had just gone to uh, had told her that she really didn't, she really needed to rest. And so she's been resting and the resting just gets boring her, but she's, you know, resting and she's resting and she doesn't have anything to live for because she's, you know, just, it just, it, you know, la 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 la. And as, as we, as both of us, as she listened to what she was telling me, and I was listening to what she was telling me, I said to her, well, you know, you have to keep doing something if you're going to keep living. And resting, if you need to rest, is doing something. It's not not doing something. And uh, if you have to rest, if you are supposed to have us uh, eight hours of sleep at night and you go to bed and you sleep at night you're resting you're doing something but you're not not doing something and the problem is that we have kind of uh sort of uh connected the the fact that resting is doing nothing and if we can get the understanding that no, there's a reason for resting and then use it for that reason and rest when you need to. However you need to do it. If it's just listening to music or listening to uh, audio books or whatever that that you in within your own being lets you rest, lets you really uh, let things go for the time being and then pick it up where you left off. I think your book is so important at this stage in our lifetime because it just seems like the hits just keep coming and coming. And you talk so much about your life force and the energy that doesn't end, it just changes. So I, I think our readers will, will really appreciate and learn so much from this book and and we thank you for coming on it was an absolute honor to speak with you well it's lovely and i love your title oh thank, <laughs> thank you. you thank you, you know so what? much yeah but people are scared of that yes yes they're scared of the menopause they're scared of hot flashes and so on well you know it's nothing to be afraid of you just live through it and yeah. we all have them think miss a misconception that you just have to get over it. You don't get over stuff. You live through it. And when you can do that, you understand it. And your body understands it. And life is a, well, life is a wow. <laughs> it really is. It is. Yes. Just the movement. I, I loved in your book, just the moving, I, the part where you're, somebody was really stuck and you're like, just shake, shake your body. Like just to even do bit. that. That's something to do yeah. Yeah. while you're, and moving through life. So thank you so much. I got so much out of your book and with all the stories that you share in the book, they're such great examples for when you are having a moment where you're feeling stuck or you're feeling lost. The examples that you used in your book were wonderful and so helpful. And just that the love that you showed your patients and listened to them. We wish there so were helpful. more doctors <laughs> yes. now that it's would do worked, that. It's worked for me. Yes. So thank, yes. You. thank you. Thanks so much for your time. We appreciate it and enjoy. Are you 102 or 103 at this? Well, I'm 102 and three quarters. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, and celebrate that last quarter before you turn 103 and, and happy early birthday. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank uh -huh. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.